My name is Chloe Farahar and I am co-founder at All Academy. And today I have with me Emma Dalmain. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. I am, good. So um, Emma is an autistic woman of colour. Um, she's an advocate and activist and fights against the harm done to autistic people in the name of curing us, in quotation marks. Um, Emma is also the author of two great books explaining autistic experience in an accessible way for children as um, uh, drawn, isn't it? Your son illustrates them. Um, the two books are Susie Spins and It's an Autism Thing I'll Help You Understand. And Emma is also the CEO of Autistic Inclusive Meets Community Group AIM and an admin on the now 17,600 plus member strong Autism Inclusivity, Inclusivity Facebook page. Um, and Emma is being incredibly kind today and doing an interview with me to actually help educate me about the autistic needs of people of colour so that we can actually, I can actually learn um, and understand how to support um, persons of colour better on the autistic spectrum. Okay, hello Emma. Hello. <laughs> Hi, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. It's always weird because Emma and I do actually chat occasionally so it's yeah. talking like we've never spoken before. Um, so I'm going to kind of jump right in yep. and very straightforward question, which is how did you discover you were autistic? Um, well, this is interesting. Like a lot of us who are later diagnosed in life, um, I found out, I found out because of my youngest son. He was my outwardly most demonstratedly autistic child. So his stimming behaviors and his um his difficulty navigating the environment was a lot more obvious than my other children who I didn't know were on the spectrum as well at that point <laughs> so when it became quite obvious that he was autistic um I went to the doctor with a list of reasons you know I looked at I looked at his behaviors and I thought well I used to do that I used to do that I still do that <laughs> And, um, you know, if he was in a busy street, he'd want to sit down on the pavement and just look up at the sky. You know, and if we, if we were walking past a certain driveway, he'd want to stop and, and he'd want to throw the pebbles to watch them bounce. You know, he'd track them and things like that. And, and I totally understood that. And I was never saying to him, you know, come on, hurry up. You know, and why wasn't I? You know, as an NT, as an NT you would think I'd be saying, come on now, come on, stop it. So... You know, I started to think, yeah, I might be. And then I went to the doctor with a list of reasons and I was sent a checklist, uh, a tick list, you know, I went for it, sent it back and was referred to mental health and went and did um, a three hour uh, appointment and was diagnosed with Asperger's, which I don't use. You know, I use autistic because there isn't a difference to me. When was that? So when were you diagnosed? I was 37, so 38, 39, 43, 43, six years ago now. And you're like many um, an autistic woman who looks much younger than their actual <laughs> age. Thank <laughs> you. Um, you know, I have a theory about that. I have a theory about that. Autistic people, we don't show a lot of facial expression. We're quite... You know, it can be hard to read whether we're really happy or really. So we don't do, we don't frown and we don't, you know. So um, I don't think we develop as many lines <laughs> as people with more animated expressions do. Yeah, Louis always looks at my face and goes, where are your wrinkles? Because I'm 30, I mean, 36 now. I don't know necessarily that I'm supposed to have wrinkles. I don't know. But yeah, he's always <laughs> like, which, where's the wrinkles? Like, um... um I, I have heard other theories as well about differences in collagen, which might make oh, really? sense in relation oh. to the higher prevalence of EDS, so Ellis Danlos in the community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I find quite interesting. They're all very interesting. <laughs> but yeah, I they guess are. Resting orty face is a very particular thing. <laughs> it is, and and then you it get is, yeah. it gets confused with um, resting swear word face, and it's yeah. Like, um, no, you can tell the difference between a resting orty face where we're thinking lots, but it's just not showing. Um, so you were diagnosed at 37. Yeah. Um, so yeah, at that point in time, 
Asperger's was still being diagnosed. It was, yeah, it was still. Um, actually, that te technically, what what he said was that with with Asperger's and autism, as you as you know, with a diagnosis of what they would have called Asperger's, was with Asperger's there's no speech delay and autism there is. So he said everything else he would have diagnosed me as autistic apart from the fact that I remember speaking at about three. Now, I couldn't ask my parents because I don't have contact with them. So I had to go off of everything that I knew about myself and things that I used to do. Um, you know, self injurious behaviors, meltdowns, smearing, you know, I did all of that. I can remember doing all of that. And um, so that, that was how I got diagnosed. I was going to say, um, how was that process for you then? I mean, that's, I, I, we don't have to go into anything, but it was pretty quick. I'd say it took about six months, absolute max, you know, but remember as again, we're going back six years, the weight now is a lot worse. The right, right. That's right the right now. The weight. Yeah. The, the weight. And I think, um, well, no, I know, you know, when anti-vaxxers and other people will be, you know, there's an epidemic, it's a holocaust, why are the rates rising so fast, you know? It's because adults are now getting diagnosed as well. And because there's better awareness and education. And that's why, you know, the weird kid, the loner, the eccentric, is now being picked up as an autistic. <laughs> So. And I definitely think there's a lot, lot more of us and that the bell curve, the shape of the autistic community um, means that we're, we're missing a lot that haven't been. Oh, definitely, definitely. The amount of times I've spoken to someone and thought, I'm sure you're on the spectrum and you don't know. Yeah. And it's sad because they'd find a whole community that they don't know about, but they just go through life feeling lost, not quite fitting in, feeling like they've walked onto the stage halfway through the play without the script. Would you say, and that's how you felt, would you say? Until oh, you God, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Very much and, so. And that's the thing. It's very isolating, isn't it? So it's, it's interesting because I'm, I'm supposed to be writing um, a blog for a university on the stigma that the autistic community faces, regardless yeah. of, um, you know, ethnicity or anything like that, just by our very action of, be, are coming across as different is very isolating and so if you're isolated all your life and then the diagnosis is actually quite it can be quite freeing yeah yeah definitely I'd say with the now I, I know from my point of view growing up with a, a white Irish mother that um I was seen as quiet you know I was no trouble I was the child who'd go off in the corner reading or go and hide in a bush you know <laughs> so I was no trouble Whereas if I'd grown up with um, a black family, I probably would have been a standoffish, rude, ignorant, you know, stubborn. So that's why there's such a stigma in the black community and a lack of diagnosis because parents don't, a lot of them don't want to believe that their children are autistic for a start. Their churches and their community, there's such a stigma that they will not, they won't want a diagnosis they won't want a label which i see as a recognition you know a lot of people think that it's a, a gateway to gaining services it's not you know it's not you know that things don't get easier once you, you get a diagnosis a, a fact, apart from the fact that you might find your community and you know you might join a few groups and but services wise nothing changes and for a parent you know that's where the fight starts and yeah and it, and i think that is an interesting difference isn't it that yeah that parents perhaps with smaller children younger children um it might be about services for people like ourselves it's more about understanding ourselves yeah I think, and definitely being kinder to ourselves and being like okay because it was interesting what you just said that with your white irish mother you say that you were just seen yeah. as not a troublemaker yeah perhaps, just a daydream yeah but perhaps if you'd been in a black family or black community you would have been seen as rude and standoffish yeah and things like that they're the phrases that i have had all my life which is yeah. like cold unapproachable standoffish and things mm -hmm. like that and it's quite hurtful because that's not how i feel on the inside 
Yeah. So it's quite, that's quite interesting. My newest label at the moment is Militant. Apparently I'm Militant. I don't think that's a bad label. <laughs> and that's the thing. It depends what you do with them because I'm... Exactly. Being, Own it. Yeah, because being a social psychologist, I think a lot of people assume that I would hate labels because I'm everything I've done is about mental health stigma and how to yeah. combat it. So people think I must hate labels. I don't. It depends on what it is and what you're doing with it. Yeah. So I have an issue with labels like schizophrenic, but I don't have an issue with labels or like or, or identities of voice hearer. It all depends kind of thing. Right. Um, I'm really going to get sidetracked. We're going to get so sidetracked because I've got a question. <laughs> yeah, well, I have um, to try and stay on, on thingy because I don't want the kids to like come bombing in any moment. <laughs> I can be part of it. Um, so I did have a question, which was, do you feel that being a woman of colour, so you've got two things there, the fact that you're a woman and yeah, the fact yeah. that you're a woman of colour, do you yeah. think that that impacted getting diagnosed later? Definitely. At school, I was um, in primary school. I was seen as very quiet, a loner, um, a know-it-all because I correct the teachers on things. Um, then in high school, I just rebelled completely. You know, I I was thrown out of school at age thirteen, so I ended up in a, a pru pupil referral unit. And um, I had my first child when I was 15. So I think being early with sexual activity, etc., was a bit to fit in. So I think as if I had have been a white cis male, I would have been picked up a lot earlier. But the thing is, back then they weren't really diagnosing autism as much anyway. Um, it was only the more very obvious cases, you know, no nonverbal communication and things like that that were picked up. Whereas, again, we would have been seen as troublemakers or, or loners or rebels. And I think is it is it even possible to pick apart the aspects relating to being a woman and being a woman of colour? Or can you, I don't know if there's any diff, because obviously we're both late diagnosed women and I, yeah. I'm trying to pick apart, is there something that you experience different to me because obviously I'm, I am white or is that just too? I think there's two there? things against me there, isn't there? Because as I said, I have been labeled militant. I'm talking from myself now. I can't speak for any other black autistic woman or woman of color, but I know that I've always been seen, not always, but I know I've been seen as aggressive and things like that. And I think that puts, that would put people off. I don't know how I'm trying to say this. <laughs> it would put, put, put them off looking further anyway. So that makes sense. So I'm seen as different in a lot of circles. If I'm in a black, in black circles, cause I'm mixed, I'm half white. If I'm in, um, a circle of white people I'm seeing as different because I'm half black. So, and then having a social communication problem on top of that. And yeah, it can be a problem for anyone who goes, oh, it's no problem. It can be a, a problem. It can disable completely. You know, if you are out and you desperately need help, you need to know what time the train is coming or you need to, you know, you, you, need, you need help and you cannot verbally communicate it, that is a problem. Yeah. So, I think that way, yeah. So maybe, so that for me is quite interesting because you're saying, yeah, if you go into a, a white circle or a black circle, it's almost like they might be ignoring what would be autistic cues, autistic experiences, because yeah. they're assuming that you're acting in accordance with the other group. Stereotypical, what they think is stereotypical way for a, a person of colour or black woman to, to act. If, if the woman period asserts herself if she if she comes across as assertive she's seen as aggressive she's immediately seen as you know oh you know it was actually a man who said i was i was too militant I'm too, you're just too militant emma so <laughs> i was told that, um you know when you so leaving school between um juniors and going into secondary and, and like teachers writing your little books to say like goodbye yeah. and i had um see you when you're prime minister 
because, Ooh, that's good. but because I was bossy that was them trying to be nice because I was bossy um yeah. it's interesting but were, you bo- were you bossy or assertive I was assertive and I did what you did I would be like yeah. because everything had to be black and white and logical I would do what it sounds like quite similar that you would do which is correct the teachers you know yeah. and I remember all they had to do is explain it and I would have been fine but I remember um in junior school we had um we were doing Joseph and the Technicolor dream coat and they made Joseph it was one of the girls from the class and yeah. I was like I don't understand she's she's a girl but you're getting her to play Joseph and they all they had to say was girls can play boys roles or it yeah. just didn't mean that anything like that it wasn't me I just didn't you're understand looking for clarification weren't you you're looking yeah. for some sort of reason yeah and instead they just got angry with me and shut me down and I remember you know I remember the first we didn't I went to a predominantly white school when I was um what six seven and I remember the first black child that I remember mm-hmm. from my class and I just remember asking quite logically why they looked different to me but I just got shushed and it was like you see don't... it's such a shame isn't it I just needed it explained yeah and then it it's wouldn't have been this taboo thing um that's going off on another tangent there as well um okay so the thing that I've been interested in um, that I see that, that you do online, which is, um, so I'm asking, can you tell me about the support groups you run offline with autistic children? Because I always love seeing the pictures you post of the sensory pits, which I think look yeah, amazing. Sure. Yeah, um, we started, um, me and uh, some other directors, we got friends, we came together and we started um, an organisation called Autistic Inclusive Meets. And it's meets because we wanted parents and autistic parents autistic adults and nc parents to access a community in a supportive environment so you know a group of us would go out and things like that you know where the parents wouldn't feel a stigma if their child had a meltdown you know because we would understand we're autistic as well and also it gives the autistic adults an outlet to be able to go out so we started that up and we started um groups now we've got the monday group which is at a local children's center and um one of the things that i had to make sure was in place was uh, sensory trays so each week we have different textures we have different aromas um a lot of what you see set out would be like i I don't know let's say mung beans and metal sieves so you think oh yeah that's for pouring you know that's for tactile and visual and you know, auditory and everything else, but it's very much for the sound and for them to watch it visually, you know, fall down. And and as we said just before we started the interview, the four till six group, the Monday group with all the sensory play, we have children that are coming in, you know, straight after school and they're so tense and wound up and they're running round and round and round the room, you know, and the new parents that will come, they'll be like, oh, you know, sorry, he's, he's very um, frustrated, you know, he's, he's quite wound up, he's just come from school. And, you know, he might not, he might not fit in, he might not relax, you know, so if he doesn't, and I'll say, look, and behind them, they'll look and the child will be regulating with the sensory play. It's so important. You know, I'm sitting here and I've, I've got this, you know, <laughs> and I've got this, you know, so it's nice. We do need things to, we're very, I am anyway, I'm very tactile and, and visual. So I like to have something to regulate me. Around my um, office my desk I've got I've got everything I've got because obviously <laughs> you can only see this part of me so it looks very, yeah, exactly. very professional yeah. up here but down here object this is a sequin dog so oh, lovely. there's so much stuff but yeah I mean I think we need we do need that and um often you know we, we have sensory things like this up on the table as well so the parents will sit down with our volunteers with directors who are all autistic um Apart from Sarah, we have one token NC on board. Sarah, she's wonderful. She, she's we reckon she's ADHD. Sarah, she's lovely. And um, but you'll notice that all the parents are the ones that are playing with the sensory aids on the table, and they half of them end up realizing that they're on the spectrum as well. So I, it's I, really nice. Even, even neurotypical. Um, so for, for those who aren't used to the language, so NT yeah. neurotypical. So basically, somebody um, who 
isn't autistic or ADHD or anything we would class as neurodivergent. Yeah. Um, and I always find that interesting when it is clearly a neurotypical person and you yeah. actually say, look, we want you to get involved and play with the, the things that, you know, the children enjoy and then they actually enjoy it. So it's yeah. like they can start to see why it's so important for any autistic person. Yeah, it is so important. Yeah. And um, I can't remember who it was that described it as oxygen, being around other autistic people as oxygen. But it's lovely to see the adults and the children relaxing. And in our group, we don't have an age limit because we might have a 17-year-old that wants to come in and play with the sensory tray. So you'll have a 17 year old playing alongside a three year old, you know, and things like that. And that doesn't mean that the mental capability of them is lowered in some way. You know, we don't have any any sort of supremacy or, or you know, it's just everybody gets on. And if you want to go, and I, I mean, I sit there and play with the sensory play. Most of the parents go and sit down next to the tray and they'll be like, I'm just going to go and sit with Jerry for a minute. But you'll see it's actually them who's doing it all. <laughs> so how it's do, really. How do you find that? Like how it. It, does it work really well then? I like that idea that you are bringing in the parents, neurotypical or not. It works really well, really well, because they will want to know how their child is feeling. And we can't speak for their child, but we can give our perspective of why their child may be reacting to things in a certain way. You know, they may not realise that their child, when they get in the car in the morning, that the car mirror is rebounding the light in a certain angle or, you know, that the music that they're playing you know there may be a song that will trigger their child because when they were playing the song last time they drove by mcdonald's and mcdonald's didn't have their morning breakfast so it reminds them of that or something like that you know it just all these things will and it's good to sit down with them and just say well what were you playing at the time what were they wearing at the time what you know and they, they don't think of these things we can they don't look at translators well. yeah 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 that's a way, good way to put it <laughs> Yeah, because you you, we're always trying to explain when people want to say that we can't speak for their children and things like that. Yeah. We're not trying to. We're trying to translate. We're just trying to help you bridge yeah. um, that communication difficulty or understanding. Yeah. But if you try and think of it from a neurotypical parent's angle as well, it could be very hard, hurtful even, for them to have a child that they cannot understand and for someone else to come in and understand their child better than they ever will <laughs> that's that's going to hurt them and that's that's also a pride thing for them you know so it can be you get parents who, who will just reject it completely you know no no you, you you're not my child you don't understand my child you'll never understand my child and then there's others who will take it on board and be like oh i didn't think of it that way and it's those parents that we can work with, the ones who are saying, you know, but Jerry's autism doesn't define him. You know, we, we what's autism's ass today? You know, we're, we're not going to let autism ruin our day. You can't work with those parents. You can try, but they see autism as an external factor that's invading their family's life and ruining it. Instead of saying that their child is wholly autistic and working with them to encourage and enable them. And here's me ranting away. Yeah, go on. Sorry. Next no, it's question. Fine. Because my next question was, um, where, what led you into activism and what kinds of acti activism and campaigning have you been involved in? So you're allowed um, to rant away. <laughs> <laughs> when my youngest was um, under assessment, I did what a lot of parents do, which is go on Google and go on Facebook. And the first group I came across was a group called, uh, I call Hell Group. It's called Autism Support and Discussion Group. Autism mm -hmm. Parent Support and Discussion Group. And it's something like 75,000 now, if not more. And you go in and it's shocking. Now, maybe, maybe if I had have been a neurotypical parent who was thinking, oh, this is terrible. My child's never gonna marry and they're gonna have a terrible life and they've got this to be. You know, if I was like that, I would have slotted right in because it was, you know, he had a meltdown today and ruined our outing. You know, we went to a theme park and I'm sitting there thinking, well, it was probably too bloody noisy and crowded and too many colors and lights and crowds and, you know, everything's unpredictable and oh. 
and parents are like, oh, babe, I'm so sorry. And, and I was thinking, what? The I won't swear. Uh, what is going on here? So I couldn't fit in there. So I thought, okay, we need a group. And I did not know I was autistic at this point. I thought we need a group where the, the parents are a little bit more accepting and are willing to be educated by autistic adults. So I opened up a group with a good uh, black autistic friend of mine called William Vanderpew. And we called it Aspirations and Autiness. And it's a secret group. It's a very sweet, nurturing little place. And um, I think it's only 2,500 members now. But, you know, I, I ended up doing that. And members would post about, you know, have you heard about this treatment for autism? And it was chlorine dioxide bleach. So I thought, well, you know, let me go and see what this is about. So I've gone in. It was horrifying. It was terrifying, actually, what I saw. So I decided to write about it. No one else had written a piece on chlorine dioxide being used as a treatment as a treatment for autism in the UK at that time. So I wrote a piece on it, um, started investigating it. Um, I alerted the media to it. So the first piece in the UK about autism and chlorine dioxide was in the mirror. Or I suppose someone called Leonardo Edwards, who has been selling chlorine dark side, who was selling chlorine dark side at that time. And I also got on London Live, and then that led to the BBC. And the reason I did all this is because our children should not have to grow up in the world where they're seen as a disease or a holocaust or an epidemic or injured or any of these things because they are just neurologically different to the so-called norm and you know they have a right to exist it shouldn't be like this and i That's always, what i find it a, a fascinating and beautiful thing within the autistic population generally speaking is this incredible sense of justice because you didn't have to do that you didn't have to and keep doing it you've been doing this for several years five yeah five and the death threats and the hatred and the rape threats and you know stuff being sent to the house and comments on my children's pictures and you know oh your daughter looks vaccine injured you know why don't you use nemechek why don't you use this you know you you want your children to be autistic because you want the dla you know you want the intention of them being autistic and um it's like it's sad. It, it, it's, it, the, the hit back from the uh, anti-vax and bleacher community and the ABA community, my God, I think they hate me more than anybody else, <laughs> is, is bad. It so really is. Why do you keep doing it? Um, it's not only me, all right? There, there's, there's Amanda, there's um, Amanda Siegler of Fear Saucy, there's um, Melissa Eaton, both dear friends of mine. There's other activists out there that don't want to be named. So it's not only me. I'm one of the ones who come out publicly and speak about it because I'm not bothered about the backlash anymore. I was at first, you know, it was quite intimidating to have that amount of hatred. You know, you wake up to 10 messages of pure hatred. Um, but if I don't do it publicly in the UK, who will? Because you have to be public. You have to go to the press and say, I've just reported a parent in Hull for giving her two two-year-old twins turpentine. That is a true case. And they will quote me in this. So the parent in Hull will look in the paper and go, oh, it was Emma Dalmain who reported me. You know, the parent in Cheshire who had a 12-year-old epileptic son on chlorine dioxide will look and say, oh, it was Emma Dalmain. So they all know who has reported them. Um, and that's just a risk I've got to, got to take. Chloe, I'm going to walk with you. We're going to go on a journey because we need to go to a charger, okay? okay. <laughs> exciting for us. So we're just going to go over here. It's going to get a little bit dark for a minute. That's and, it's going to go, whoop, there we go. and then it's going to get very pink and pretty, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So well, we're just going to put it in the, here. The reason I ask is because in, in all different capacities, I don't do anything near the kind of activism that you do in any sense but there are definitely strong things that I have 
you know, sense of justice where I'm like, I have to keep going. My, my, like I say, my, my particular specialization is mental health stigma reduction. That's my main thing. And now it's sort of autistic stigma reduction and it's hard, but I, even when there's really horrible days, you're kind of like, no, it needs to be done. It needs to be just the world needs yeah. to be more just than it is. Um, so I just find it amazing that you keep going because, you know, I have heard you've, you've spoken before about how you get treated um, and how people act towards The Daily Mail did a good piece on it. The Daily Mail, actually, everybody goes, oh, no, the Daily Mail. But the Daily Mail has a new editor who is very pro-vaccine and um, is producing some really good pieces at the moment, um, citing actual scientific studies, which is brilliant for the Daily Mail. But their, their last piece they did with me was about um, all the rape threats and everything else I've got. Um, our organisation protested... Um, who did we protest last? I think it was January the 26th. Is it that far back? I think it was January the 26th that we did a Vax 2. We protested the premiere of Vax 2 in London. Uh, if you don't know what Vax 2 is, it's a film produced by um, Polly Tommy, who's a, a mother of an autistic son. She's used, you, and Chloe, don't be worried about airing this because anybody can find this out as public knowledge. You know, all you've got to do is go and look on her post and you'll see that she has used H for. You know, she's used everything she can think of on her son. And guess what? He's still autistic. And she runs uh, the Autism Trust in Surrey. And uh, she's very anti-vax. And her and Andrew Wakefield, who is the um, disgraced doctor who's no longer allowed to practice in the UK due to his falsified report to The Lancet, which was thrown out, uh, which said that the MMR causes autism, which it does not. But it caused so much damage and is still causing damage now. So many parents are not vaccinating their children against deadly diseases. And because we went, well, I've been protesting them for years, but it was particularly bad after we protested them there at the tabernacle. Um, Polly had to be restrained by the police, <laughs> not the police, the security, because she came rushing towards me because she saw me there and she completely, you know, freaked out. Um, so the abuse did get pretty bad at that point. Phone calls started, you know, and it was just, it, was, um, it wasn't good. But, but it always seems that you just keep going because, like you say, this shouldn't be happening to children. It no, it shouldn't. To anyone. It shouldn't. And um, my, my seven-year-old daughter has actually turned around to me and said, when, when I start your job and I take over from you, mummy, what name do I use? You know, she's, she's so clever. She's so clever. And... and the kids know exactly what I do. I don't hide it from them. They know that there's bad people out there that, that like little kids in certain ways that they shouldn't. They know that there's parents that um, kill their children for being autistic, for side. You know, they know about the uh, cure culture. They know about ABA. You know, if, if her and my, my um, other, older son are playing, you know, and he wants her to come up and he goes, come on, you know, you can play with this. She'll say, don't ABA me. <laughs> And, um, you know, they, they need me to carry on because one day one of them will, I, I believe, take over the campaigning because... And, and these are hard also conversations. Have... These are hard conversations that anybody can have. People don't like to hear these conversations. No, they don't. They need to be had. Yeah. Um, okay, so, because we're going to get stuck on this question. Um, <laughs> Okay, so then I've got here, what should clinicians know about black autistic people and people of colour in terms of identifying they are autistic, the diagnosis process and assessment? Right, this is where the language um, around autism needs to change, right? Because, again, black families, it's, it's seen in many cultures of, of um, black communities to be seen as a disgrace you know, as, as, um, as devil possession, you know, there's so many things that I see, it's, it's not very well understood. So when you've got a white, um, pediatrician sitting in front of you saying disorder, you know, uh, suffering with has, um, it's going to put people off. You know, it's, they don't want that. They, 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 didn't, they didn't sign up for that, you know. <laughs> That's the way they're going to look at that. And um, I think if, if, if the diagnosis 
pathway was different and if the way that they were told you know your child is autistic not has autism your child is autistic they will operate in a different way to a neurotypical child they may need these accommodations may they may not you know this could be put in place they may see this in a different way this may trigger them if I, if it was explained to them in that way instead of i'm so sorry to tell you that your child has autism and they're going to find it very hard during life because they don't understand how society works so put them into this program where they'll have punishments reinforcers planned ignoring and discipline to make them fit into society which i'm entering aba now apply behavioral analysis if it wasn't seen like that 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 would make such a big difference do you think the neurodiversity paradigm or even if we don't call it that or the narrative but the idea that we are just neurologically different do you think that's something that those communities might be more willing to accept about their children than obviously the medical model because the medical model i is totally so agree, is deeply problematic yeah. Yeah, no, definitely, I do. I do. There's so many positives um, to having an autistic child. There are, and, and they're not told them. You know, they are, what they see, especially if they have a non-verbal communicating child, is, you know, how will this child ever function in society? Well, it's society's job to make it that we, as autistics, whether we verbal, verbally communicate or not, can access, can be included. And but they don't see it that way. And, and um, I mean, I know many. Just so, just so it's clear, I know many black autistic um, parents. I know many parents that are neurotypical black, very accepting, very encouraging of their children. But and there is a but. Many of these parents have been stigmatized by their church. They've been told they can't attend anymore. They've been told, you know, that your child is possessed. They've been told by family members, your child is rude. You know, I was told by family members um, from my, my children, you know, from their black family members, you know, he's just rude, he's ignorant, you must beat him, you must, you know, you must put things, you know, you know, and it was, you must put boundaries in place, they're not listening, they're stubborn, they're rude. And back in the day, I used to listen to that because I didn't know any different, you know. So 20 odd years ago i was slapping my children because i was told that was the right thing to do and in the black culture it is very about discipline and there is the valid worry as well that black people have that if they have a child who is a nonverbal communicator he's now seven and um he's melting down all right they will see it as people will look at their child and see them as threatening. And they are worried about what happens when this child is six foot tall and kicking off in the street and the policeman wants to come and tase him, take him in the van, and then they find out he died on the way to the police station. And so that's another thing that needs to change. You know, the black community have been disempowered, they've been um, victimized, and they see police as a threat because our skin is seen as a weapon. You know, so if, I if only, yeah, sorry, if, I, if only the education, the wording was different, it would change so much. And see those behaviours as autistic behaviours as opposed to what, yeah. black criminal behaviour. It's yeah. autistic behaviour. I've had, my, I've had one of my, my sons up um, at the hospital when um, he had a psychotic break and it also triggered a meltdown. And straight away, you know, he was he was loud, and he's he kept, probably could be seen as threatening because he's six foot tall or something. And straight away, the security is surrounding. I'm like, move back! You need to move back. He's autistic. Getting here isn't helping anybody. You've got to move back. And it ended up with me in front of him. I don't know if I can do this. I, I can try because I'm not holding the phone. <laughs> I'm trying to. But it ended up with me with my arms outstretched, backing like he's here. My son's here, and I'm. I've got my arms around him. I'm I've opened my arms and I'm stepping backwards with my hands rigid, moving the police backwards because they wouldn't move back because they called the police in the end. You know, so we had four police and three, um, three security with someone who's having a meltdown. And that's the same with whether it's an autistic experience that is a or a mental someone who's mentally ill or yeah. you know they see 
someone who's black, someone who's brown, someone who's tall, someone who's not tall, someone who's loud, someone who's distressed, and they immediately think, you know, this person's a threat. We've got to put them down. We've got to get them down on the floor and we've got to hold them down. And, you know, to make the public feel safer in their eyes. Yeah. So, yeah. So, okay. Again, the language and yeah. perception needs to change. I mean, I think, I think it's relatively interesting as well. In, so I, I had, um, uh, um, there was a law student, so he's graduated now um, from East Africa and he's gone back now. And he wanted to put in place or at least discuss with his government. Um, mm. And I said, because he said to me, I remember him saying to me, Chloe, can you not go to your government and talk to them about this? I was like, how on earth would I do that? Because for him, as a law graduate, it's easier for him to go and talk to the government out there, which I think yeah. is amazing to sit down and mm -hmm. say to them that they needed a neurodiversity bill. And what I find interesting is, and you're completely right, not that it's better in any way, but it's interesting that the majority of their narrative about autism is that it's the devil or yeah. they're being punished for something. But to some extent that could be better because they haven't got to the stage that, for instance, America is at at the moment, which is incredibly medicalized autistic experiences, this horrible deficit and disorder. Have you seen, um, um, I highly advise anybody watching this to go and watch The Worst Place in the World to be Disabled. All right, it's set out in um, Africa somewhere, I can't remember exactly where, all right, but they have got places they've got camps off out in the bush where you can take your adult or your child and say oh, I don't want them and they'll either one chain them up in a barn with a bucket and feed them and, uh, and feed them for years you know and they're not allowed out of this barn that that's where they are or if you go to a witch doctor you can pay them with a bottle of schnapps and they'll take your child down to the river and send them back to the spirits and um, the film that I was working on um, the reason I jump, there's um, parts in that that they couldn't put in. They couldn't put them in because of the threat um, that people in the film were getting if they exposed certain things that were happening in Sierra Leone. You know, there's places that they'll take your child and bury them alive for you. You know, so even medicalized language is better than that. I, think. I was think. I, I apologize. I didn't mean it in the sense that the behavior. No, was better yeah. what I was thinking is can we can as like a concerted effort get in there quicker with a better narrative to obviously the narrative at the moment is deeply deeply problematic but can we get in there with the it's neurological difference there's strength yeah. these are what they could be um and it's not this awful sentence kind of thing yeah uh, because yeah the narrative needs to change and and sadly, as much as the uk we because we live here we we feel that there's so much work to be done so much yeah work. but actually when you look at lots of different um populations we're, we're a lot further ahead <laughs> yeah which i find fascinating as well yeah it is but the way that disability is accepted in different parts of the world is so diverse and terrifying in some ways i know um i was at the the goober foundation had a, it's a, a black foundation of uh, parents of autistic and disabled children and they had a, an event in uh, parliament um last year year before i saw you and oh did you see that oh, God. <laughs> oh you were weren't you yeah because they would you know they were I, I got what they were doing, you know, they were saying, you know, it's a superpower, it's this, it's that, but they were unwilling to confront the fact that in their own countries, they have children being killed because of their disability. And when I spoke about it, um, I managed to get hold of the mic. The only person that raised an objection, the whole place, I'd say maybe you and one other man, you were the only two people that weren't black in there that I can remember. There may have been at tops five people that were not black in there. And when I started speaking about it, the only person, and everyone else was black, African, Jamaican, you know, from all different 
countries and the only person to stand up and try and stop me from speaking was a Turkish man who said that I was bordering, bordering on racism. So, you know, he obviously got very worried. I don't know why. And this you know, is what I mean when I say that we need to be having those very, very uncomfortable, difficult conversations. We can't yeah. be silent in those conversations. Then but they do get slow. Yeah, but, and often, not that time, but often by the black community because they don't want to confront that side of what's happening. You know, um, and they need to. They need to look at that in a big way. <laughs> So many, we've had one parent came to our group and she said to me that her African priest had told her that if she, if she got her son to drink from a giant African land snail shell, he would, um, he'd be able to talk. There was also powdered parrot head put into yogurts that would make you talk. If you took off your dirty knickers in the morning and put them on the floor and had the child jump over them, it would enable them to talk. You know, and it's all this stigma and misinformation and it's just mind boggling. More education, more acceptance, you know, more black activists speaking out. That's what's needed. And thank you very much for inviting me on today because it's given me that, you know, people may not like what I'm saying. They may have a problem with it. If they have a problem with it, they're more than welcome to message me and talk to me about it. But that is what's happening. And this is what I'm saying is I, I, I want to know these things and that's why. And, but the thing is you don't have to educate me on this, but you are. And I'm so grateful for that because we need to hear, like I say, have these very difficult conversations about things. You're very welcome. Okay. So I don't want to keep you too much longer. I've got a couple yeah. more bits, which I think you've kind of touched on this already. So this was a question about what should mental health services know about supporting black autistic people or pe obviously people, uh, persons of color with mental health concerns. And your main thing, which I already agree with and know about is seeing it for what it is. You know, it's a mental health issue that you need to let that person be safe, but you can't yeah. restrain somebody. If someone's having a mental health issue because autism's not a mental health issue. Yeah. Um, don't immediately look on them as a threat. Look for the trigger. Look for what is causing that breakdown in communication, that panic, that worry. You know, what is it exactly that's causing it? Because don't immediately think security. You know, that, that day I told you about, because I can only speak from my own experience again, you know, when, I, I, when they managed, when, when they did move away and we got in to see a doctor, I'll use that term loosely. Her suggestion was that I take him home and call the police if he starts again. And I said, do you want me to call the police on my six foot two black son so they can pin him down? I said, I don't think so. And she ended up calling security for me because of how angry I got. Why would so, her? So, so I've, I have had to deal with it. She didn't want to deal with it. Because as soon as a mental health professional sees the word autism on someone's notes, they don't want to know. Yeah. And it's the same for autistic children when they are sent to camps or they try to be sent to camps for some help. Oh no, it's autism. Yeah. You know, there's such a misconception, it seems, that someone who is autistic can also have mental health problems. They can also uh, be Down syndrome. I've met so many parents. Um, one of our, our board members actually has um, an autistic Down syndrome daughter. And um, they are told that if their child isn't speaking, they're not communicating, that's just Down syndrome. That's just Down syndrome. No, it's not. It's actually completely separate, you know? So um, again, education. And because I, I talk about, I, I do talks, and I, I did one recently on that, that very thing, which is people conflating autistic experience with mental health issues or vice versa yeah. as if we can't also experience which obviously we do extreme anxiety depression i was gonna say that yeah voice hearing you know anything mental health wise we can also experience um yeah and that's kind of why i was asking that question as well is there something different that services would need to consider when it comes to you've got an autistic person 
with a mental health issue, but there's also mm -hmm. perhaps a cultural um, or community difference. And there's also sensory issues. So if you've got someone who is having a mental health crisis who's autistic, they may also be reacting to light, sound, all of those things, and to get them into a, a, a not a darkened room, but you know, a dimmer room and close the door and make them feel safe and be able to talk to them on a one-to-one -one level with respect, you know, not hurrying them on for the next patient, not seeing them as a threat. All these things would make such a difference. And I mean, that's something we just really struggle with in the UK anyway. And I've seen lots of really important posts about um, obviously more relating to the US, but why do we call the police out for a mental health issue for somebody? Why do we call the police out for a social services issue? You know, why they, they shouldn't be the first port of call. So when you ring 999, you should be saying, I need a mental health. Visit. Yeah. Yeah. Oh you know. God. Yeah. That would be massive, wasn't it? If we had something like 999, but for mental health, where you could get a mental health expert to come out very fast. Because that person's suggestion, which is, you know, if, if your son has another break, that to ring the police. And it's kind of like, why was that the suggestion? Because I have dealt with, because of my parents, um, all my, well, since I was about 14 or 15, with, for instance, social services or the mental health crisis team. I have called the police out a couple of times, but that's because we couldn't enter the property. Not, yeah. you know what I mean? So why was that suggestion and not, Call um, call the mental health crisis team, which is the I what I have to do. You know, it's and this wasn't a white mental health professional. This was um, an Indian woman. Yeah, you know, and she just didn't want to know. It's just it was you know she just didn't want to know, and he had already flipped a trolley like it was nothing, like a trolley that someone lies on. He'd flip that like it was nothing. He'd put his head through a plate of glass window there. And she wanted to send him home like that. And she did send him home like that. You know, and um, the help, I think, was given within, um, it was a psychosis unit. I think it was within five days. But for those five days, you know, he was suffering. He was terrified. You know, all these different things were happening. There was tactile hallucinations. There was visual hallucinations. There was auditory <laughs> you know that everything was happening and there was no help given so how did you move through that what what was the outcome for him if you don't mind discussing it obviously you don't have uh, help yeah medication you know they, they did there was help but it was it was the fact that she could have called them and had them there you know she could have brought that help could have started that night not five days later which is so, really important when, yeah, it particularly, like you say, if it's a psychotic break, it's quite important to try and support them very early Oh, my early yeah. yeah. Someone who has had a psychotic break may not recognise you. They may think that you're working against them, that you're working with people to keep them there, to victimise them, to hurt them, mm -hmm. that you're in league with, with a conspiracy. You know, um, they, won't wanna, mm -hmm. they may not want to go outside because cars driving mm -hmm. past might have someone in them that wants to hurt them. You know, this is what we had. You know, the loss numbers were a big thing. You know, numbers were everywhere. You know, oh, there's a number there that's there for a reason. All of this. And I had to do a crash course in mental health. Honestly, over that five days, I was reading everything I could, watching everything I could to help as much as I could. Um, but the thing, I... the thing is, I am a parent and technically... I should not have had to do that because there are professionals out there who should have been saying, okay, this is what we can put in place. We can help you with this. This is what you should do. This is what you should put out of reach. You know, and I strongly believe that he, again, if he'd been a white cis male, he would have been treated very differently. She saw him as a threat and as violent and she wanted him out of our hospital. And that was it. Take him home and call the police. I think that then that different perspective, I mean, generally speaking, the mental health services in the UK have been decimated. And then on top of that, you've got the ignorance relating to autistic mental health yeah. and then uh, a person of colour as well. So yeah, it's like, exactly. Okay, so my next and uh, next last question is what can non-persons of colour do to support autistic people of colour? So what, and what can I do? So that's, you've got a general one. You're doing it. You're, you're allowing me to have a voice and to say, 
what I believe needs to be done from my perspective. So if you are a non-black um, ally, you know, elevate us, share blogs, share the news, you know, don't, don't be an all lives matter person. We're not saying all lives don't matter. You know, what we're saying is that black lives mattering shouldn't offend you, you know, because we do matter. My children do matter. So what you can do as allies, as family, as the general public is to listen. Don't speak over us, listen. And yeah, that's it really. <laughs> Empower us. Don't, you know, take it away. That's, the things I've seen on social media this week are, are dreadful. You know, I had a list. I put up a post, you know, if, if they weren't stabbing each other, then maybe on our streets, then maybe we may, would want to listen to them. You know, these are disempowered. Um, there's no jobs. You know, there's, this is what starts gang culture, a feeling of exclusion, disempowerment, no jobs, not knowing our own culture because it's not taught to us. All of these things trigger a chain reaction. And people saying that, you know, about the riots, the riots start usually as peaceful protests. And then the police come in and start spraying rubber bullets and threats and water cannons, whatever else they want to use, tear gas. And that's what starts a riot. You know, change so. never comes from anything peaceful. Change always comes no, from. But isn't it sad that we're that black people are having to put themselves in harm's way because someone was murdered? It's constantly any again any aggression, any assertiveness from a black person, a black woman, a black man, a black child, a black person of, of any gender is seen as aggression, is seen as violence, is seen as something that needs to be shut down. Why? And I don't know. I yeah. don't know how to answer that question because I find it very confusing myself. <laughs> Why? Um, so do I. But yeah, you know, especially the, the, best, the best one we hear is um, go back home. You know, I was born here. Yeah. You know, and I've heard go back home. I've been chased by um, a white man with a baseball bat through an estate. There was loads of loads of us. You know, that I my friends were mostly black, and. Um, he was having an argument with his girlfriend and he turned around and saw us all watching because you would you'd you'd watch a six foot tall man with no shirt on and a baseball bat screaming up at a tower block you would you know and yeah he chased us through the estate screaming you little black b-a-s-t-a-r-d-s -S so um i'd usually just say this one <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> trying to be good for glory but yeah you know the amount of racism that i have experienced and is is scary and i'm mixed i'm i've got the privilege of lighter skin you know the so-called privilege of lighter skin so looking at it from a darker person's perspective i can't do apart from my my daughter she's darker skin than me she's beautiful and the prejudice she has had is is disgusting so we're going to keep having these for some difficult conversations definitely yeah That's what's i think important. a good thing Okay, just to end on something hopefully positive. So I put, what hope can you see for black autistics and person of color autistics and the autistic community? And where can we go that's positive for our shared community? Again, keep elevating black voices, keep letting us have, you know, there's a table, there's a seat, give us a plate, you know, let us, let us interact with you and let us, um, we're not threatening, you know, we're just assertive. And that's what you can do, just bring us in. Because my thing has always been where, because I, I, my bubble is very small, very small. I've got like three friends kind of thing. Yeah. So it's kind of like, how do I, I mean, I, to be honest, I don't have much power myself, but whatever little power I might have in any situation, to so say I do get to, I don't know, invite people to a conference on autistic yeah. experience and things like that how do i approach people without it being tokenistic because that's what i don't want i don't want it to feel tokenistic i don't want it to feel like i'm i'm meeting a quota i want yeah, it to be the token autistic black person on the show i know what you mean i want it to I be i don't feel that way with this i would say that you you maybe maybe have a third party maybe have me or i'll put you in contact with william 
um, there's so many, there's Melissa Simmons, you know, there's so many um, black because actors. that's the person I can, her, her, I, I watched um, in her, a video that she did recently. And that's the thing, you know, I'm going to look and I'm going to be like, I appreciate that narrative. I, that's a narrative I can respect that I'm interested in, that I can learn from or that other people can learn from. So it's how, yeah, how do I approach that without it feeling tokenistic and it genuinely being, I want to hear your voice. I want to hear and learn. Yeah. Or I'd, I'd be going through, through um, a black autistic advocate and just saying, look, you know, we want to do this. We want to have this much time allotted to uh, a different culture because we believe that it needs a platform. Can we do this? Yeah. Um, okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so my last thing, yeah. Is so do you see hope for the whole autistic community, but also all our little intersections within that autistic community? Do you see hope for us? If we can dispel with supremacy, yeah. You know, I see so much supremacy in the autistic community, you know, um, without going into it. That's what we need. We need um, people not to be ashamed because there's nothing to be ashamed of. Being autistic isn't something to be ashamed of. It's simply a different way of existing and communicating and navigating the world. So, yeah, there is hope. Inclusion. We just need inclusion and we need people to, like you and like others to bring us all in and that's what i want i literally because my whole thing so harry always jokes about it that um because this year is not a good year this is going to no, be no. Jesus, the we've weirdest had year and in history and I, swear, and I swear it's been terrible. yeah yeah it's the weirdest year in history and mm -hmm. I, I, it's more than weird i know i it's been awful distressing all these kinds of things but it's just the most bizarre situation and experience for a number of reasons but harry also calls it um because i always say i want to scoop all the orties and that's how i think of it i want to scoop all of them up and keep them safe and you know do education and all this kind of thing so we talk keep talking about it as the great orty scoop of 2020 <laughs> and that's how i see it that's what that's my hope that's yeah how i keep going is this idea that i can not just me and I, and I don't want it to just be I don't it doesn't need to be my face it doesn't need to be my name it doesn't I'm not interested in that it's genuinely bringing people together so that they are not isolated and they're not alone so that's my exactly. hope. that's what we're about autistic inclusive mates getting people out into the community in an inclusive environment with their peers yeah it is that because people there is a stigma whether we like it or not, against autism, against autistic people in, in general. So it is so needed knowing, you know, those parents that are in the group that are being advised by autistic adults in autism inclusivity, they know that there's a place that they can go and ask advice where people will be coming from a perspective which may enable them to understand their children in a way that they otherwise wouldn't have been able to. I guess that's also where I see the hope coming from from the work that you do, because like you say, autism includes, um, the, the, the bigger group is in autism inclusivity, isn't it? That's yeah, that's the uh, Facebook, but, but they're not connected. Yeah, that's the, yeah, that's the bigger one. By, yeah. by myself and John Greeley, who's um, one of my very best friends in the world. And um, yeah, we opened that together. And then um, autistic inclusive meet the same as separate. Yeah. So we do we do recommend people go to the Facebook group, but yeah, we are separate. But that I see the hope there because like you say, yes, there will be yeah. a large number of people that will they won't be ready or ever ready to listen to autistic people helping them, genuinely wanting to help them yeah. understand their children or themselves um better in terms of being autistic. Um and so I think I that I do see. I think I see that hope there because you do get fantastic comments where it's like, thanks to this group, I now lo no longer see it, autism in this way. And I started yeah, seeing it in this way. ABA and things like that. Yeah, which is brilliant. When we get one of those posts, it's, it's great. I mean, we get those posts a lot. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think there is hope. 
and that's what I'm trying to keep finding even if it's tiny little bits because this year is so awful for so many different reasons and for so yeah. many different people and obviously nowhere near as awful for me as it is for other populations but I keep trying desperately to find little tiny pockets of hope so that we yeah. can keep going. <laughs> um yeah so this has been a really 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 fantastic talk and I thank really you it so much very welcome so thank you people for listening